Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, lovely uh, August evening. Um, we're waiting for, we apologize if there were any problems accessing the link. Um, we're delighted to have Erin McKean, who is from the Campaign Legal Center. Today, we're going to be talking about public financing of elections. I'm the coordinator of uh, Big Money Out VA, which is a group that looks at campaign finance reform. Let me just... Uh, um, open this presentation. And just to let you know uh, what we'll be discussing over the next hour, it's sort of making it a brief introduction to the issue of big money in politics. I'll mention the issues facing the federal, uh, the, the federal context of money in politics briefly, but also focusing basically on uh, uh, perspectives from Virginia in terms of some of the legislation that we're look, looking at, talking about why public financing of elections is a very interesting issue, and it might be of interest to legislators in the next General Assembly that starts on January 10th. Uh, look at opportunities for reform and potential entry points for action. First of all, just to, to give you the context, what is American Promise Big Money Out? We're nationally, it's a sort of in the democracy reform space, American Promise is unique, and it's specifically looking at a constitutional amendment to uh to uh, that would allow states and the and the congress to regulate election spending which had been taken away by 40 years of supreme court rulings certainly most recently the most one that is familiar to all of us is the citizens united uh, that ruling by the supreme court in january of 2010 so, so um, ooh, i'm getting an echo here could everybody uh, uh mute so, so that there isn't an echo. And then after we started about five years ago, we realized in Virginia that certainly we are one of the most paid, uh, pay to play state. We have very lax campaign finance reform. So we're looking at that. And obviously the whole issue of money in politics is why do we care about this? Because we, the people, not money, super PACs or corporations govern it. And that goes back 250 years in Virginia history in our first uh, Virginia Declaration of Rights. It's it's the the right of of the people of the government uh, who are governed to to rule and be represented. Um, I think just going back, we can we can recognize the challenge in our democracy right now is that 72 percent of uh, Americans feel that uh, democracy is threatened. Um, that the, this obviously is for different reasons, perhaps on the right or left, but the, CB, the CBS poll in 2022, it was quite remarkable that 86% of Americans agree that the influence, the major threat is the uh, influence of money in politics. We as a group commissioned the Wasson Center to do some polling in two, 2021. And we were sort of worried because we were paying for it ourselves, but the results were in line with national perceptions that four out of five Virginians, irrespective of party, feel that large donors have too much influence on in our elections. So why should we care about money and politics? I think everybody in this room, if you go around it, basically has their entry point for what, what public policies do you care about? drug prices, health care system, mass incarceration, nursing home care, that's a big issue. And um, uh, broadband access certainly came up during COVID, school boards and elections. And I'm certain that some of you have heard about the Moms for Liberty, which has deemed himself to be a grassroots organization. You know, they generate their money through t-shirt sales, but meanwhile, they're getting money from a lot of the uh, dark, uh, the right, right wing uh, funding for um, funding and problems with school boards. And so when you look on the federal side, and this is where the Supreme Court ruling had come in, and also do you look at 10, you've seen this astronomical growth in, the, in expenditures. This is both for presidential and for congressional. You can see it hits oh, 16 million in, in 2020. Um, what is surprising in 2022 was even though the actual spending on congressional races went down, Open Secrets, which is the national organization that looks at money and politics, had actually estimated, and it's very difficult to estimate these, 25% of the cost of elections, 2.3 billion, come from independent expenditures, 
which in the arena, in the universe of money and politics, is that money that is not coordinated with the candidates, actually. It's issue ads, it's dark money. So increasingly, uh, we, we can see that more and more money is coming into our elections. And I think we maybe we could put some money on 2024. Definitely, we all know it's going to be the most expensive race in, 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 in U.S. history just because of all that money coming in. And we can see it coming in. But now we're going to, there are two sides of the campaign finance coin. One is the federal elections, and we are influenced by federal elections. And when Citizens United came around, 22 states had to change their campaign finance rules. But in Virginia, we didn't because we have no rules. We are we have no dollar limits for uh, campaign contribution, uh, no limits on cor corporations. 22, limit, 22 states have limits on corporations. The federal government, since Teddy Roosevelt in 1907, when he passed the Tillman Act, he, he banned and corp money from corporations and unions. But in Virginia, there are no restrictions. And worse, there are no restrictions on pol uh, politicians' personal use of campaign donations, which means that they can take that money and they can just spend it on going to Hawaii for a, a vacation or spending on, uh, on their mortgage. So this, this is seriously, we always viewed that this is the lowest hanging fruit, but the bill has been introduced every year since 2014, and somehow it can't get passed. And there's limited regular oversight of the Department of Elections. And you can see um, when you look at the, you know, the trend, it's similar to the federal trend, um, but this is just simply, this has nothing to do with independent expenditures, dark money. This is the fact that we have no limits. And the last election, you know, especially in 2021, it was $147 million for the, the, the gubernatorial race. That didn't include his self-financing because, as we know, because of Buckley versus Vallejo, that, that candidates can self-finance. Well, this was one of um, the most expensive races. We have some of, among, among the most expensive races in, in the United States. And what happens when you look at this, this is, I took some uh, data from Open Secrets, is we have lost our voice. And when you look at this money that went into that election in 2021, it's pretty shocking. Not only are they the highest, but when you look at the composition of those donations, large donations above $10,000 accounted for 75% of all Virginia contributions. And the more shocking statistics is 83% of donors contributing less, uh, more than 500 uh, less than $500 was only 8% uh, of total contributions. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't give candidates uh, $500. So there is something really skewed and, and, and problematic of, of, about our system that and the results of having no contributions. And just going into the the primary, it was sort of crazy. This data, and I'm sure you've read, it was it's in the news, it's the most expensive race, and it's a money arms race between Clean Virginia and Dominion. Yeah. And, and I took like the mail, these are like 15 people, 15 candidates, races that had over a million dollars by the time that the primary rolled around and they're either funded by Dominion or they're funded funded by Clean Clean Virginia. So I think that you know of any year that this is in the in the public interest and in the public eye that there's an opportunity for reform here. Um, just how that translates in Virginia's reputation, the Coalition for Integrity had a 2020 uh, swamp index that they basically rated the states based on transparency and accountability to to Virginia uh, citizens, and we ranked 46th. And if you can see, it's Utah, Michigan, Arizona, Idaho, and Wyoming that are below us. So I think, you know, basically our voice as citizens should be raised and say, we can do better this year. And some of the bills that we're looking for in this year, previous years, two years ago, there were 24 bills that were introduced, two passed. Last year, there were 13 bills. There was one passed. Actually, there were quite a few bills that sailed through the Senate, and then they were killed in a Republican a partisan vote in the on the subcommittee on the on the House side. Um, so it was very it was sort of a, a depressing year. But I think, as I said, I think that there's an opportunity to to get a lot of legislators, especially we have the most competitive elections in Virginia history. We're gonna have a whole new slate of uh, actors down in Richmond. 
We're looking at restricting personal use of campaign donations. Can we finally get this over the, uh, over the, you know, get this, get this passed after, after over 10 years of introducing this bill, disclosure of independent expenditures, just on the restricting personal use, Jennifer Boisco, who was a champion last year, the Senator said she's going to champion it this year. We're not quite sure who or whether there should be somebody introducing it on the House side. Disclosure of Yeah, folks, unfortunately, uh, Nancy's having some problems with her Wi-Fi at her house. Um, if Nancy can hear us, I suggest she turn off her video and just show her picture and can when she does get back. Yeah. She's pretty near the end of this. There we go. Where did she go? I think she went away. <laughs> well, I think we can turn this over to Aaron and uh, get started on the presentation. Great. Well, it's uh, it's great to be here. I hope you know if if Nancy's able to make it back in, we'll make sure we welcome her back. Uh, but I'm I'm really overjoyed to be here tonight. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate you know big money out Virginia. Uh, asking me to join you guys uh, to talk about public financing, uh, easily one of my favorite campaign finance topics because it's it's uh, a constantly evolving uh, subject and people are always trying new things across the country in public financing, seeing what they can do, how we can make it better, and how we can really lift up the voices of those regular folks uh, in the campaign finance process and in the political process. Uh, and uh, just to how to get started here, right? My name is Aaron McKean, as uh, folks have said, and I'm legal counsel with Campaign Legal Center, and I work specifically on state and local reform, uh, focused on campaign finance reform at the state and local level. Uh, CLC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based in DC, uh, and we work in states and cities across the country, uh, and we work to promote every American's right to participate in the democratic process. And that's actually what brings us to our topic tonight, which is small dollar donor public financing systems. Uh, we see that this is one of the most effective ways uh, to increase democratic participation. It's one of the most effective ways to broaden participation in our political process. And we all know, as uh, Nancy was describing before, uh, we all know that there are problems with big money uh, in our elections, right? Among other things, it alienates regular folks from the political process. It makes it seem like, you know, the political process is for uh, people with deep pockets who can spend big and basically drown out the voices of everyone else. But that's not what we want, right? What we want is uh, a democracy that's more representative, that's more accountable, and that increases participation and brings more people into the process. Uh, and at this point, I'm just gonna uh, extend another thank you to Nancy um, as we've brought her back in uh, to the Zoom tonight. Um, so we, as we uh, get into public financing, um, before we go any further, I do want to begin with a broad definition of what public financing is, uh, just to get it started. Um, public financing itself is a system that makes public funds available to candidates for office. And to access those funds, candidates agree to certain conditions. Now, that is the most uh, kind of bare bones framing of what public financing is. And we're going to build it up tonight. And to do that, uh, I'm going to cover the goals of public financing. And, I'm going, and then we're going to go into how public financing really works. And we'll talk about some common features of public financing programs across the country. And then we'll get into two distinct models of public financing. And that's those small dollar donor public financing systems 
that I want to highlight there. Um, just a little preview, we're going to talk about matching fund systems, and then we're going to talk about democracy voucher or democracy dollar systems. And then finally, I'll get into uh, some of the kind of key policy points uh, for moving forward on public financing. You know, there's a lot of ways to make sure that public financing is successful in the long run. Uh, and there are some key points to cover or to highlight there. Um, we won't cover all of them, but uh, I can just give you a bit of a flavor for it to get us started. Uh, so with that, beginning with the goals, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that public financing is not a new idea. It has been around for more than a century. Um, it was first introduced as a proposal in Congress in uh, 1904. And it was recognized at that time that public financing was really a way to make sure that candidates didn't have to rely on you know, wealthy networks, wealthy donors, or their personal wealth. Uh, to run for office. It was really recognized that that was a key piece of corruption, right? Seeing those big donors give big money to candidates who then turn around and do favors for those big donors. That's the problem we want to address. And then those were the first proposals, but we saw the first program actually get implemented in the 70s, right? When Congress uh, passed the presidential public financing system. Now that's a grant system that provided, um, uh, it provides grants to presidential candidates. We all know this program because it appears on our tax return every year, right? That $3 checkoff. Um, now that program hasn't really been used quite as much with recent presidential candidates, but we'll get into why that is. Um, and you know what, at, at, at its base, what we're talking about is a program that provides funds to presidential candidates who qualify for the program and qualify for the funds. But since then, what we've seen is a proliferation of public financing programs, right? We're talking about programs in municipalities, programs in states across the country where they've innovated new, new types of public financing, different ways to broaden participation, to make it more accessible, uh, for folks in their communities to make sure that they can you know, uh, support the candidates of their choice with contributions. So um, key to this discussion tonight is the goal of broadening participation. And I wanna highlight it in two ways. Um, small dollar donor public financing really benefits candidates uh, by making sure that they can leverage their community support instead of having to rely on those big donors or those wealthy networks or their own self-funded uh, candidacies, right? That takes a lot of time and that takes uh, a lot of resources to, to raise that kind of money to run a competitive campaign. But when you can provide public okay. funding and make sure that you're actually engaging the electorate that's, at the same uh, time, uh, that's, that's really, really not, excuse me, this is not full of ice. This has got. Hey, Stephen, can you can you mute? Can you mute your? Can, you can everybody up? mute? Yeah. Full of ice, like all the way up. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen, you need to mute. Stephen, can you mute? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, um, I think where I was at was we were talking about how uh, public financing. Uh, really benefits candidates by making sure that uh, they can draw on their community support instead of having to rely on those wealthy donors. And I think I'm okay. Uh, okay. Uh, instead of relying on those wealthy donors, right? Um, and here's the key with that. Uh, what we know is that historically, candidates for office and politicians generally have been whiter and more male than the average population, right? And in general, that's been because those are the folks who have had more access to those resources. They've had access to their own funds that they could bankroll a campaign. Um, they've had those wealthy donor networks to, to get them through the finish line. Uh, at the same time, what that means is that 
you know, minority groups or women didn't have access to those resources and weren't able to run competitive campaigns. But public financing means that you don't have to rely on those big donors anymore. You don't have to have access to those wealthy networks in order to run a competitive campaign. So it gives everybody a, a possibility of running for office, of participating in that way in our political process. And that's what's really exciting about it from the, uh, from the candidate side. And then from the flip side, when we're talking about you know, constituents, voters, people in the community, what we're talking about there is citizens have an opportunity to participate in the program in a different way. They're able to make contributions that are more meaningful, that give an incentive to candidates to reach out to them, to make sure that we're amplifying their voices in the political process because, excuse me, because the public financing system makes that possible. It means that those, uh, those folks, again, uh, I should say, uh, what we know is that historically, campaign contributors have been whiter and more male than the rest of the population, than the average population, right? And that means that the folks who don't have access to those resources, who don't have access to um, wealth, to contribute to campaigns. Those have been folks who are typically minority groups, women, other groups, uh, working class folks. You know, they don't have quite as much money to contribute to a campaign. I can't dump $10,000 into, um, you know, my, my favorite politician's pocket. But public financing means that a contribution that I make could mean a bit more and could mean that a candidate takes a look at me as a contributor. It really changes the incentives and amplifies the voices of all those folks. And so that's the broad look at uh, how we increase participation through public financing, right? Where we're talking about the goals. But now I want to turn to really how it works, right? And like I said in the beginning, I want to cover two things. One is going to be common features of programs. This won't be everything in a program, but um, I'm gonna hit on five features of public financing programs just to give a taste of kind of what the mechanics are and how we make them successful. And then we'll get into the two uh, distinct models of public financing that are kind of the cutting edge uh, models at the moment that we think are really great options for considering for a new model, for a new program. Uh, so beginning with those common features, uh, these, are, these public financing programs are really set up uh, to provide candidates with, you know, enough resources that they can run a competitive campaign. And they're also set up so that, um, excuse me, uh, they're also set up to require the candidate to agree to conditions uh, that maintain the integrity of the program, right? To make sure that public funds are spent responsibly. We're giving public funds to candidates. We want to make sure that that's actually being done in, a, in an above board, ethical, proper way. Uh, and so the, I'll go through five key pieces, and then uh, and then we'll turn to the models. Uh, the, the first one I want to highlight is called qualifying contributions. These are contributions that uh, demonstrate a candidate's you know support in the community. They could be small dollar donations, you know, something from ten dollars to two hundred dollars, somewhere in there, uh, and you gather a certain number of them to demonstrate that you have community support as a candidate. And that's a part of qualifying for the program. We don't want to necessarily give public funds right, to anybody who shows up to run as a candidate. You could end up with sham candidates. You could end up with uh, candidates who really aren't in it for um, you know, maintaining the integrity of the program. They really just want to be able to skate on public funds. The, um, the key piece is a candidate demonstrates the community support. And that helps them qualify for the program to get more, uh, to get access to more public funding to run that competitive campaign. And then the second one I want to highlight is lower contribution limits. Um, this will be an interesting issue in Virginia for sure, because Virginia, as Nancy highlighted before, doesn't have contribution limits at the moment. Uh, but what we typically see is that where a public financing program is in, is in place, there will be contribution limits set for privately financed candidates, 
And then a publicly financed candidate will take a lower contribution limit. So an individual could give, say, $5,000 to a privately financed candidate. But then if they wanted to give a contribution to a publicly financed candidate, it would be lower, something like $500 or $250, depending on what makes sense for that raise. Um, this is a key piece, right? Because what we're talking about is uh, making sure that um, making sure that it's not big money, right? That's bankrolling these candidates. The goal of public financing is to make sure we're elevating the voices of regular folks, not the big donors. And so, having lower contribution limits is a way to do that. And that's something that those candidates agree to when they sign up for the program. Um, the third thing I want to highlight is uh, debates, public debates. Uh, this is something you know everybody has seen a public debate on TV or maybe even heard one on the radio. Uh, but these are one of the ways that we, you know, inform the electorate about who's running for office and what they believe in. Uh, it's really important that public financing is seen as creating uh, more participation, creating more visibility, creating more conversation. Uh, in the political process and requiring publicly financed candidates to participate in public forums or public debates is an important way of making sure that those public dollars are being used responsibly and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, right? Getting those candidates to, to interact with the electorate more. Um, the fourth one that I want to highlight is audits and you know restrictions on spending. Um, these are key for the integrity of the program, right? You have audits to make sure people are spending the money correctly, they're doing the accounting right, because you're talking about giving someone public funds to run their campaign, and you wanna make sure they're doing that right. Um, and in addition, there'd be rules that go along with that. The rules would be restrictions on, uh, on the use of public funds to make sure that they're actually being used for campaign purposes and not for something else. And then finally, I just want to highlight something that kind of underlies all this, uh, that's sort of the subtext, but we'll just make it the text is, um, all these programs are opt-in programs. They're not mandatory. They're opt-in programs. And that's how we make sure that, you know, people who want to run for office and want to participate in these programs can participate in these programs, but we're not going to force anyone to do it. Maybe they already have campaign uh, community support. Maybe they already have access to their donor networks uh, and they don't see public financing as something that they need for running for office. And that's fine, but these are uh, voluntary programs and that's an important piece of it. There are more uh, features that we could get into, but you know we can cover those in questions. We can cover those later. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a taste of this. And so now I wanna to turn to uh, talking about two key models. Um, and these may have been things that you've heard of, or maybe you haven't heard of them, but we can get into it. And I just want to highlight uh, first public matching, uh, public matching funds programs. And then we'll talk about democracy voucher or democracy dollar programs. Uh, with public matching funds, uh, what we're talking about is um, basically what we call a multiple match. If someone, if a let's say a contributor gives like $20 or gives a small contribution, that contribution gets matched you know, by some sort of multiple, two, three, four times. And that's the way that you um, kind of amplify the voices of those regular folks who can give $20 as opposed to giving $20,000, right? So you match, that, uh, you match that contribution with public funds and all of a sudden your $20 contribution could become $100, right? And, that, and in that way, uh, you're changing the incentives, right? All of a sudden, candidates see that contributor as much more uh, helpful for that campaign. And so that's an incentive for them to reach out to folks who they typically wouldn't reach out to. Um, maybe you know, those folks can only give $20, but now that's more valuable because it's supplemented with those public funds. Now, we know this stuff works because there's a really amazing success story out of New York City. Um, and New York City isn't the only one, but New York City is one that's been running for at least it's a, over three decades. And we have studies that show repeatedly that this program has amplified the voices of folks across the city. 
and it has improved the ability of people who have typically been left out of the system uh, to actually be brought into the system to participate in the program. We've seen, you know, before the program was in place in the 19, it was put in place at the end of the 1980s. Uh, and before that, you could see that donors were mostly concentrated, um, you know, in certain, in certain zip codes, uh, in certain neighborhoods where it was the wealthy folks. Uh, but after the program started and candidates started using it, you could see how uh, individuals from less wealthy neighborhoods, from more diverse neighborhoods, uh, were actually able to participate and did participate. They felt more confident that their donation of $20, for example, actually meant something to candidates who were running in their districts. And that's a key piece that we were talking about before, right? Broadening participation, making it more accessible to everyone uh, and not just those wealthy donors. Uh, so that's the first model. And then the second model is uh, the democracy voucher model. And this one is, uh, we, we call it democracy vouchers because that's what started in Seattle. Um, we'll get to the details of Seattle in a moment, but the key piece here is that eligible residents in the district uh, are basically given the opportunity to assign a certificate uh, to a candidate of their choice. And that certificate represents a certain amount of campaign funds. Uh, it could be like $25, it could be $50, uh, but at the end of the day, I as a, uh, an eligible resident in the district can make that contribution uh, of public funds, and then the candidates can take that and turn that into, or I can assign that to a candidate, and the candidate can turn that into campaign cash that they can use for their campaign. Now, those are small dollar donations, but the key piece here, right, is that you're giving it to everybody in the district. Um, and this means that folks who maybe they're lower income or maybe they're fixed income and they don't have extra room in their budget, right, to make a, a contribution, right, of $100 or something. You know, that makes a huge difference. But now what you're saying is, here's this pub these public funds that you can assign to a candidate and you have this political power. Uh, candidates all of a sudden see you as a contributor. Um, and what we saw in the Seattle program was a real success. Uh, folks from every part of Seattle have been able to give uh, democracy voucher contributions to candidates across, uh, across the spectrum, across the city, um, even folks from uh, you know, less wealthy neighborhoods, uh, minority neighborhoods, folks who uh, are more working class, they're able to participate in the program, in the campaign finance part of our political system because they have access to these democracy vouchers, these certificates. And so those are the two models. And I realize, you know, we're, we're giving a very high level of what those are. Uh, but, but I do think it's important to recognize that these are things that, um, uh, these are things that have been implemented in cities and states across the US, right? We're talking three dozen or more programs. Uh, it's matching funds programs at the state and the city level in certain places. Uh, we've got democracy vouchers in Seattle, as well as in, uh, there's a new program that has been passed in Oakland. Uh, they have not implemented yet, but uh, that's the plan over the next couple of years. And so we're going to see how they go. But one thing that we can all rely on is, you know, there have been studies showing both in New York City, in that example, as well as Seattle, that we increase participation, we make it more accessible uh, for both candidates and for uh, folks who want to make those contributions to candidates of their choice. Um, there are some pieces that I want to highlight as uh, ways that we ensure the success of these programs, right? And, um, you know, over the long, you know, the, I guess what we talk about a lot of times, right, is the, the matching funds, or we talk about the, the vouchers, and we talk about certain numbers. But there are other pieces to public financing programs that ensure their success. And those include things like updating the program, right, or modernizing it, making sure that it keeps up with campaign finance practices uh, as they change, right? Because we know big money, as it moves through the system, uh, it's always going to find a way to try to get 
into our elections. That means campaign styles change. That means campaign practices change. And public financing has to change with it. Um, what we saw with the presidential um, public funding uh, program is they didn't update it. They didn't update it. And you know, it was used for years for many candidates. And then in the last couple of decades, folks have stopped using it, right? Because uh, it wasn't updated, it wasn't modernized to reflect the changes in our campaign finance system that have happened over the last few decades. Uh, so that's the first one I wanna highlight. The second one is public education. Um, it's not enough just to have this program in place. You have to have an agency or you have to have folks educating the public and educating candidates on how the program works, how they can use the program, how it benefits them, right? Um, how are we making the system more accessible to them? How are we bringing them in? Um, making sure that that public education is out there on, you know, maybe it's events, maybe it's uh, making sure there's guides and manuals available, making sure there's PSAs out there that say, hey, look, your uh, democracy vouchers just arrived in the mail. You can use those to contribute to candidates of your choice. Uh, making sure that reaches people is key to making sure that the system works, right? It's not enough just to give it to them. You got to help folks along and make sure you're bringing them into the system. And then finally, um, I want to, we're going to talk very briefly about a very big subject, which is how do you decide on a funding stream? This is like probably one of the biggest questions that everybody faces when they're thinking about implementing a public financing system. And it's, it can be difficult because you're really talking about how do you gather the public funds and then how do you distribute them right for campaigns these are things that people don't necessarily love doing uh on their own but we do see value in it and uh deciding that funding stream is is always a kind of a challenging choice um typically what we recommend for folks is that there's uh a mandated amount of money that is um, appropriated from a general fund. And that is, uh, you know, that that sets the bar, making sure that there is money available for the program that's not going to run out of funds. However, as much as that is our typical recommendation, we recognize that every system is going to be different. You've got, like I said a few times now, you've got more than three dozen programs and everybody does it a little bit different. Um, Seattle has their own. Uh, dedicated uh, uh, tax levy that they use. Um, but that's going to be, you know, that's always going to be a process for them, making sure that they have the funds they need for their program. Um, the uh, and, and if you're talking at the state level, right, you're often talking about the budget process. And the budget process is always going to be subject to, you know, a lot of political push and pull, and that's always going to be difficult. Um, so we recognize that, but that's almost always just going to lead us back to the same thing of you've got to have a very deep conversation. Excuse me. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, you're always going to have to have a deep conversation about where that money can come from. How can you make it the most secure in terms of getting um, you know consistent funding for the program? Because what we know is as a program sticks around for more years, people become more familiar with it and they use it and people like it a lot. Uh, so it's important to have that consistent funding, uh, but it's gonna be different in every place. Um, and then the last thought I wanna leave you with is, you know, public financing, we think it does a lot of great things, right? Um, especially, you know, these big goals of broadening participation, both for candidates and for, excuse me, and for constituents. Um, but it's not a panacea. I think everybody has heard that before. You know, nothing is a panacea. It's always got to be part of a bigger system. We have this view of our campaign finance system that says public financing is a part of the solution. Uh, but there are other things like transparency, contribution limits, which will be important in, in Virginia, um, and other pieces like coordination. These are all big topics that kind of go along with, um, you know, making the, I should say, those are all pieces to the big campaign finance puzzle that have to be considered. Um, one additional thought that I had on, you know, just focusing on Virginia in particular is, you know, it might be the case that 
things might not work out at the state level, or maybe they uh, could be challenging at the state level. And that, that doesn't mean that you can't consider public financing, but you could consider different models of it. Um, and by that, I mean, you could look more like, or more at um, you know, municipal or county funding. Um, Maryland, for example, has a model that says that's a it's a state legislation. It's state legislation that says that counties can institute their own public financing programs, and the state will help administer those. But that's one way to sort of kind of get the state out of the way a bit and let municipalities, let counties, you know, be those laboratories of democracy within the, within the state, and you know, make it a pilot program. Give it an opportunity to to um, flourish at the city level. Give people an idea of how it can be successful, and then see where you can go from there. Um, so that's the place that I want to leave you with. And I want to, you know, I am available for questions. I'm happy to continue the discussion. Uh, and I just want to also just say thank you to everyone for letting me be here tonight. <clears throat> Yeah, people would like to put questions in the chat. Please feel free to do that or raise your hand. Uh, we do have a couple of comments. Chris uh, Comer uh, made a comment on the use of the presidential uh, tax checkoff and you know him not realizing that it, it wasn't a deduction from his taxes. And Aaron, you mentioned that it hasn't really been highlighted much lately because we have a much more uh, <laughs> Open, open political uh, financing system now. Do you have any more comments on that? Maybe how to make that checkoff system work better? Well, you know, I think it really goes back to what I was saying just a couple minutes ago, right? About that public education piece. Because I also was under the same impression as Chris was, you know, just a few years ago. Um, that when I checked that $3 checkoff, that I was somehow changing uh, how much money I was giving to the government or something like that. But um, but there's no notes on you know the the IRS form to tell you exactly how that's working, and Chris is right, right? You just you check the box, and that means three dollars goes in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's coming directly out of your pocket. Um, and it's really important to make that clear, and uh, you know make sure people understand how the funding system works, because we don't want to end up in a system where people think you know we're just taking directly from every Joe Schmo, uh, you know, who's filling out their tax forms. We just, you know, this is a system, not, not just pulling from individuals. Yeah. Uh, Madeline also asked about <clears throat> public financing dollars, where the money comes from. And we've, looking at some research we've put together, se several states have uh, identified sources that are non-taxpayer funded. So that seems to, from our perspective, to be pretty important to try and find a way that taxpayers, payers, like regular taxpayers aren't paying, you know, you know, money isn't being taken out of their pockets to be redirected to some somebody else. So there's some innovation in that area, I, I think. Yeah, and I think there's a variety of ways to do it, right? You could look at you know, making sure that you do have, uh, maybe it's something from the general fund, right? Where it's just a, a set amount of money coming from the general fund, or maybe it's a set amount of money coming from a particular uh, tax. Uh, but you could also see how it's, uh, it can be diversified, right? Maybe it's not all coming from tax dollars. It could be from tax dollars. It could be from fines. It could be from penalties. Um, you know, maybe somebody's enforcing campaign finance laws. Right. And when they do that enforcement, <laughs> right, they get fines, they get fees from doing that. And that could be money that's directed to the campaign finance programs. Um, making sure that, you know, I think there are good examples. You know, Maine is one that comes to mind. They, they have their own model for how to do public financing, but their, uh, their fund itself is funded from a number of different sources. Cool. Uh, Chris has an interesting question. <laughs> you want to read that one? Uh, let me see. I, oh, why not? Why not make everybody take public financing? Then billionaires can't self-fund and blow past all the little guys running against them or her. 
Good question. Well, you know, there are it, there are some there's a there's a big mix of answers for this one. Um, you know, part of it is there are constitutional issues, right? The Supreme Court has recognized that folks can spend as much of their own funds on their uh, on their campaigns as they want. There's not they're not going to limit how much a billionaire puts into their own campaign for office. And you can see that happening in Illinois, right? You've got billionaires running against billionaires, and that's how that works. Um, but there are constitutional issues with restricting how much someone can spend on their own campaign. Um, and then the additional piece, and this is more of the political piece, or the, the kind of the perception of the program, right, is, um, you know, do you want to see public funds going to billionaires to run their campaigns? And, you know, that's a political question that folks also won't necessarily love that perception, mm -hmm. right? You don't love a public program that's just going to boost billionaires. Uh, so, so there's a variety of, of discussions around that, although I do think there are, you know, certainly good arguments for, you know, making sure that people are, I guess, being clean with their campaign funds, right? Like, that's really the, the key piece here. We want people to be transparent. We want them to be open about where their money's coming from. We want them to be, uh, you know, ethical in the way they're spending that money. Um, and it, and, you know, those are all pieces that come with a uh, public financing program, as well as those other uh, campaign finance reforms that I mentioned earlier. Um, Aaron, I have a question. Hopefully, my I won't, won't be frozen out this time. Um, so, as I we're having a meeting with Senator Deeds, who, as people know, is from Charlottesville. He's on the P and E committee. Um, he's interested in the public financing aspects. He originally comes from a rural area, and we were saying, okay, another legislator is drafting a limits bill, saying you might be interested in this because legislators, when we talk to them, say, hey, if you limit what we get, it's difficult to run a campaign. So this is a sort of a companion bill. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, we said, okay, we're going to take that New York model you know, the New York state model mm -hmm. versus and versus like the Seattle model, the voucher model, which actually Marcus Simon, one of a delegate, had introduced that in the Virginia legislature. And he actually had a follow up bill because it died uh, introducing it in municipalities, like you say, the laboratory of democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, are we right in terms of saying that the the New York State model is is an innovative model that would work in Virginia? We seem it seems like the voucher program is very administratively heavy. You have to print out these vouchers. You have to mail the vouchers. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, it's difficult to 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 recommend a model. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I think it is difficult to recommend a model. Um, one of the reasons I think it's difficult is that New York State, while it's similar to Virginia in many ways, is very different, right? Um, everybody kind of has to make a I, I think when people are coming up with these programs, they have to make a lot of choices about what the policies are, what the goals are, how, and then how that kind of transforms into the program itself, right? Uh, the policy preferences in Virginia might be a little different. And they might be based on, you know, how is the program going to be administered? If the structures in, in Virginia are a little different for administering public financing, then, you know, the procedures might have to change from how it's done in New York. Uh, I don't know that one, I, I don't think I would say that one model is better than another, but it's more about what choices are you going to make along the way um, to make that model work for Virginia? And you could see how people or how how uh, cities and states are innovating with this uh, because you can also see hybrid models, right? Um, Washington D.C. adopted a matching funds program that also provides uh, grants to candidates. So when the candidate qualifies for the program, right, they've got their qualifying contributions, they've agreed to certain conditions. Uh, once they're qualified, they get an initial grant. And then they're able to raise uh, they're able to raise contributions and get those contributions matched, and that's a way that you kind of have a hybrid um, that gives a little bit more flexibility in some ways. 
for candidates and for the city to actually administer the program and figure out how to do it best for them. And that's something to consider uh, as you're developing a program. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's really a cookie cutter thing. It's more of a, a thing of there are many policy choices that go into creating a program, and you got to kind of consider each one along the way to make sure it works for the state or works for the county or works for the city that it's going to be in. And then a question about financing, which I think is really important. As Bill said, there, there's messaging issues. And I know a lot of Democrats who say, you know, public financing, I don't think my taxpayer dollars should fund that. But in Virginia, I mean, what we're looking at is looking at, well, I know in Connecticut, they take unused assets to sell, but that's not a guaranteed revenue, stable revenue scheme. It seems like it would depend on how many unused assets. But one uh, one option for Virginia is we're starting to uh, authorize all these casinos mm -hmm. and there's millions and millions of dollars go going into that and there's tax money coming. So it seems like if you're looking at a revenue stream that maybe you could look at, uh, say, uh, uh, Budget, budgetary, well, it's all budgetary, but you know, sort of saying, here's an appropriated amount for for the supporting the infrastructure, you know, the staff that you need. And then saying, and then we're going to take the money for the actual public financing of candidates from this revenue stream of mm -hmm. casinos. I mean, in a messaging, doesn't it make it easier to message that, especially to Republicans? Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, I will say I am not the messaging guru. <laughs> um, but the um, but I do think it's important to recognize that uh, when we're talking about public financing, what you're talking about is an alternative to the current system, right? The current system is big donors, wealthy networks dominate the system and drown out the voices of regular folks. And this is an opportunity to have an alternative. Um, yes, it will take some public funds. However, it's uh, when you compare, you know, how much public funding it takes compared to, you know, the budget of Virginia or compared to the budget of New York State, um, you know, it's it's often a, a very small amount in comparison. And then the other piece I like to highlight for folks is that this is an opportunity to invest in our democracy. It's not, um, you know, it, like a democracy takes work. I think everybody recognizes that, right? And what we know is we got to put in the work to make the democracy work for us. And that's this is how we empower folks on the ground. It's how you empower regular people who don't have those deep pockets and make sure that the system is actually working for them, right? They're going to put a little bit of money into it so that we change the incentives, we change the structures. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to stop anybody from spending their billions if they want to do it, but we are going to give folks an opportunity to have their voice heard and to have their voice amplified um, and to really bring them into the political system in a way they haven't been. Well, thank you. Um, Bill, are there any more questions in the chat? Uh, let me see. I don't think so. Yeah, no, we're good. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of end and say, along with just thanking Aaron himself, but I just want to thank the Campaign Legal Center, who over the years has, I mean, Aaron is part of a group and they offer advice and support to state um, state people and state legislation, and, and they have been so responsive in terms of providing training and even to the point of reviewing a lot of the bills so that there are, you know, the bills that we introduce, have legislators introduce that they they represent best practices. Um, so I just, and I just wanted to show in the next, uh, we're, we're doing these democracy is brewing events. Um, the next one that's coming up is basically looking at a limits pack limits bill. Um, and we've got, we've got uh, uh, Aaron's colleague, Elizabeth Schimmick from the Campaign Legal Center, who is gonna be talking about uh, what sort of national best practices around the country. Oregon is one of the states that has been struggling as has been Virginia to get legislation passed seriously. They, at least they're a ballot initiative state. So they, the people, when they do the ballot initiative saying we want li limits, but somehow they can't get the bills passed through the, the, the legislators. So we're having a discussion on this and we're bringing in Jared, uh, 
the Marnus, who is now he's been promoted, so he's the Maryland uh, State Administrator of Elections, but he's he was the head of their campaign finance um, office for 18 years. And Maryland has some very interesting, you know, it's very, very easy, transparent system of limits that might be useful. We also have um, instituted with a series of partners like the um, Common Cause, uh, uh, Represent Us, um, a good governance uh, uh, scorecard. And so I don't know, Bill, you want to put the link in there because we're asking people to, we're asking candidates to go fill in the scorecard, which has, has 10 questions on voting rights, including restoration of voting rights for felons, ranked choice voting, campaign finance, and ethics reform. So thus far, we've got about 50 um, candidates out of 250 candidates who are running for office in Virginia for the General Assembly. Um, two Republicans uh, and, and a, quite a few independents, a libertarian signed up today. Um, maybe we should have started off focusing on the Republicans, but but there, this is a nonpartisan approach to just saying we, as Aaron says, we support a transparent democracy that functions and works for all citizens. And then just save the date, Democracy Day. We're going to have our second Democracy Day on January 23rd in Richmond. It should be fun. Last year, it was great fun. We did it with ranked choice voting. We had almost 60 people. This year, hopefully, we'll get more than 100 people down there from both parties because this is a nonpartisan issue. Having good government work for you is certainly a nonpartisan issue. So that we hope that you join us. Um, uh, we're excited to work in tandem with the Campaign Legal Center, the Brennan Center. These organizations are very helpful in supporting us. Uh, and Aaron, we'll get back to you in terms of Senator Deeds. If he's interested in, you know, sending a bill for drafting, um, what we'd like to is to have to share that with the campaign legal center just to look at at how that you know how that relates if there are missing pieces. So anyway, thank you. And Bill has his hand up. Yeah, anyone from Virginia that's on the on our Zoom here tonight, if you're interested in interacting with your candidates with regard to the Good Governance Scorecard or Democracy Day or, or passing you know campaign finance laws, um, please contact. Uh, Nancy directly. Just drop Nancy a line and say you're interested, and we'll we'll work with you and uh, seeing how we can best assist you in talking to the candidates in your area. Yeah. So thank you, Aaron. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Sorry about the problems with the link, and sorry for me being frozen out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks everybody.